He's accused of four homicides linked to one of the country's most mysterious multiple murder cases. It became the worst unsolved serial killing in American history. I did try to warn her, with your hitchhiking, this could happen to you. After 20 years and 49 dead women, a puzzle that has long haunted Seattle may soon be solved. Everywhere I go around this county, I can count the victims. As Gary Leon Ridgway awaits trial for murder, police work feverishly to prove that he is the Green River Killer. He don't deserve to live. From now until everybody presently living dies, the name of Ridgway is going to ring a certain bell in a lot of minds. Next on Mugshots, Gary Ridgway and the Green River Murders. On July 15, 1982, two young boys bicycled across the narrow Meeker Bridge over the Green River in the Seattle suburb of Kent. They paused to look down into the water. There, caught on a branch, they saw the floating body of 16-year-old Wendy Cofield. On August 12th, a worker at a cattle slaughterhouse on the banks of the Green River discovered the body of Deborah Bonner. That same day, 16-year-old Opal Mills called her parents from a phone booth in a park on Pacific Highway South. Then she disappeared. Everything just went crazy. Um, you know your child is gone, and where do you look for him? She my baby girl. Detective Dave Reichert of the King County Sheriff's Office was the lead investigator on the murders. Three days later, on August 15th, two more bodies were found. And uh, uh, during that uh, scene processing, I found another body on the riverbank. And on Monday morning, on August 16th, we knew we had, uh, we probably had a serial killer. The autopsies determined that all three women had been strangled and sexually assaulted. But police were only able to identify one of them. Marsha Faye Chapman, 31, a prostitute and mother of three small children, had been in the water longer than a week. She had last been seen two weeks earlier on Pacific Highway South. They all had prostitution arrests, or at least frequented prostitution areas. And we were beginning to prepare ourselves and put a team together to uh, investigate these series of murders. That afternoon, Reichert's boss, Major Richard Kraske, gathered 25 detectives from surrounding jurisdictions to compare notes and exchange theories. When uh, uh, it was realized that a serial killer was working here, essentially Seattle was uh, pretty much shocked over it. I mean, uh, five young ladies in the river uh, caused a panic. Detectives hit the streets with photos to try to identify the other two women, and within a week, names were put to the faces. The first, 17-year-old Cynthia Cookie Hines, had been in the water three days. She had been last seen four nights earlier at a convenience store on a section of Pacific Highway South known as The Strip. The other victim that Detective Reichert found on the riverbank was Opal Mills. Her best friend called one day and said, uh, maybe you should read the paper and see who this is. It uh, says a girl with red hair. And, and Opal had dyed her hair red, uh, a dark red. And so when I saw that, I guess that's the moment I knew that it was her. She was strangled. I know she wore a scarf sometimes. And I felt for years like it was, <laughs> I, I quit wearing scarves because I felt like um, it was my scarf that did it. The 
search for the Green River Killer would now focus on the Strip, a 10-mile stretch of highway south of Seattle, studded with motels, fast food joints, honky-tonk saloons, and a topless bar. It was, at best, a smaller version of maybe Spanish Harlem and Times Square put together on a bad night in each neighborhood. Retired cab driver Melvin Foster used to drive on the strip. It was a zoo with the cages open and the animals running wild. You could drive down Pacific Highway uh, uh, south and essentially uh, see women sashaying, uh, blowing kisses at you. Um, if you stopped at a stoplight, uh, they, they would uh, sit on the hood of your car. Police received many tips from the public and more missing persons reports were filed about other prostitutes. But investigators soon learned that the unstable lifestyles of these women made it very difficult to know if they were really missing. They would move on to Vancouver, British Columbia, or Portland, Oregon, or Sacramento, or San Francisco, or Las Vegas. They were constantly they were on this kind of circuit. And uh, so it was very difficult for people to understand the, the milieu in which all of these people were last seen. Most of the victims had uh, five, six, eight, nine, ten, twelve, fifteen different names. Uh, some with last names, some without, some nicknames, several different birth dates, and descriptions varied. Uh, they would dye their hair different colors, uh, change their addresses. King County investigators sent crime scene evidence from the Green River murders to the FBI's Behavioral Sciences Unit at Quantico, Virginia. The FBI worked up a psychological profile of the killer. What they find at these crime scenes seems to suggest that he's not planning to do this ahead of time. He's not going out into the night with the rape or murder kit like you oftentimes find. He's done something on the spur of the moment that seems to suggest that there might be something in the interaction between the killer and the victim, something verbal or maybe even nonverbal that seems to set him off in some fashion. Then, in September, the body of a sixth prostitute was found. She had been strangled, like the others. Taxi driver Melvin Foster would provide police with an intriguing tip. I've seen some of these girls. I've seen them downtown. I've carried them a time or two in the cab. And I was asking myself, why would anyone want to hurt these girls? They're out there trying to make a living and wait for better times to get there. Then I got to thinking, I know somebody that needs taken down because I knew him to be working a 14-year-old runaway out of the back of his Oldsmobile station wagon. Working off Foster's lead, police questioned the man with the Oldsmobile, but after he passed a polygraph test, he was eliminated as a suspect. Before long, police were more interested in Melvin Foster and his familiarity with so many of the prostitutes. He became the first serious suspect. They were looking for people who had a lot of contact with them. And, uh, and they were looking for people who might come forward with a tip because the profile from the FBI said this person might inject themselves in a case. I went to the cops and uh, I guess I knew the streets a little bit better than some of the vice cops did. Because all of a sudden, the major crimes unit got very interested in me. On September 20th, Foster was called into the sheriff's office for questioning. After vehemently denying any involvement in the murders, he agreed to take a polygraph test immediately. American Polygraph Association tells you you have to have a 90-minute interview. The two parties involved have to agree to the language of all the questions. There were no control questions. And it was just right out of the blue. It just come in and bang, 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 and it's it hooked up and we're going. Foster failed the test. I had a nervous disorder come up. I'd have had to take a Valium or something to get past it. That would have flattened all the gauges. You know, all their needles and stuff would have just went flat line. There was no way in this world I could get past that exam. Foster's home was searched, but nothing was found to tie him to the crimes. He was placed under 24-hour surveillance for the next two months.
When we identified Melvin Foster as a person of interest at that time, we worked hard on him. We, we had him under surveillance. We did some search warrants, and we found some things about him that bothered us. In late November, police searched Melvin Foster's home a second time, but still found nothing useful. It there was after they took the house apart on the second search. Seven hours. For a while, no new bodies turned up. Two months later, Major Kraske felt so sure that Foster was their man and was under such pressure to reduce costs, he agreed to disband the original task force. All the investigators on the Green River case, except Dave Reichert, were reassigned. I felt uh, a little bit abandoned uh, in late 1982 and through 1983, being left alone with these cases by myself. During the next six months, missing persons reports continued to pour in. Then, in May of 1983, the body of a seventh victim, 21-year-old Carol Ann Christensen, was found in a wooded area in Maple Valley, 15 miles east of the Strip. She had been last seen only five days earlier, leaving a tavern where she worked on Pacific Highway South. A week earlier, 18-year-old prostitute Marie Malvar had disappeared after getting into a pickup truck at a bus stop on the Strip. Her friend initially followed the vehicle, but then lost sight of it. Four days later, the friend went out searching with Malvar's father. They search around and they find a truck that is very similar to the one the boyfriend saw at what turns out to be Gary Ridgway's house. So they go down to Des Moines police. The Des Moines, Washington police sent a detective to question Ridgway. The way we understand it, it was very nonchalant. Well, is there somebody in here? And no, there's nobody in here, okay. They had a very, very good lead back then. And so then you have to start counting the women who died after Marie Malvar and say, wow, that's a travesty. Gary Ridgway was a recently divorced 34-year-old truck painter and outdoorsman. This was the first time that Ridgway was directly questioned about one of the Green River victims. With the task force disbanded and with Melvin Foster considered the prime suspect, Ridgway's home and vehicle were not even searched by the Des Moines police, and Detective Dave Reichert wouldn't be informed of this incident for six months. Meanwhile, the FBI's psychological profile had the task force focusing hard on other suspects before coming back to Gary Ridgway. Next, on Mugshots. Details of Ridgway's past reveal intriguing clues to the mysterious murders. By the spring of 1983, the investigation into the Green River murders had yielded suspects, but no arrests. Seven women had been found strangled in the area around Seattle's Green River, and the task force, which had numbered 25 detectives, was disbanded, leaving the case in the hands of a single investigator. In May, when another prostitute disappeared, 34-year-old Gary Leon Ridgway was the last person seen with her. He was questioned by local police and let go. But a closer look at his past reveals a number of red flags. He was born on February 18, 1949, in Salt Lake City. He moved with his parents and two brothers to this house in Seattle when he was 11. His father drove a bus on the Strip, and friends say he used to complain about the prostitutes on his route. His mother, meanwhile, was domineering. One friend recalls her smashing a plate over the father's head. Ridgway's father meekly walked away. Ridgway went to Taiyi High School, where Terry Rochelle was two grades ahead of him. One day, my sister was walking home from school, and we had about a mile to walk from the high school. So she dropped her books, and, and Gary was not far away, and he came and picked them up for her. And he says, oh, I'll just carry him home for you. And so he carried him all the way to our house. And she said she kind of had a little crush on him after that, because she thought he was so nice. But Rochelle does recall Ridgway getting into some trouble. A bunch of us went over to a dance hall, and my brother went along with me, and so I guess he went in the bathroom, and he, Gary said something to him, and my brother said, just knock it off, and Gary turned around and peed on my brother's leg, and then my brother knocked him down, you know, fight. We all got kicked out. 
After graduating high school at age 20, Ridgway joined the Navy. What people will tell you about that kind of a person is that he seemed so utterly normal. While stationed in San Diego, he married his first wife. But investigators would learn that after a six-month tour, he returned home to find his wife had moved in with two men and had become a prostitute. Ridgway left the Navy, moved back to Seattle, and divorced her. This kind of anger towards women that's just deep within the psyche and is, can't even be articulated. After a failed attempt to join a local police department, Ridgway started working as a truck painter for the Kenworth Trucking Company, a job he would hold for almost 30 years. Ridgway married his second wife in 1973. She would later tell investigators that while they were married, she and Ridgway used to ride their bikes past the slaughterhouse and the Meeker Bridge. They had sex there in the tall grass on the banks of the Green River. He preferred sex in the woods, she said, or out in the open, or while he was driving. He even tied her up for sex a few times. He was so normal. He was cute, young, you know, like everybody else. You know, just young and carefree and just a nice young man. According to his second wife, Ridgway would often be gone during the evenings for long periods of time, returning to the house dirty or wet. He regularly carried plastic tarp in the back of his truck, the same kind later found covering the bodies of some of the Green River Killer's victims. Later girlfriends told investigators that Ridgway's second wife had started singing in bars, that she had gone to a strip bar where Ridgway's boss saw her dance topless. They were divorced in 1981, and Ridgway began to date other women and frequent the strip for prostitutes. You had so many women here that you, you couldn't avoid them. Uh, to get warm, uh, they would go to Denny's and have a cup of coffee, or they'd go into uh, uh, bus shelters, or to hotel lobbies just to hang out uh, and obviously see if they could find some men. On Christmas Eve, 1981, Ridgway arrived late to meet his girlfriend at a dance on the Strip. She says he told her that he couldn't believe it. He had just almost killed a woman. She understood that to mean a prostitute. He quickly dropped the subject. Somehow, it never came back up. And yet, when you think about it, they are that normal because they practice, they work at it very, very hard to conceal this demon that's burning inside of them. Then, on May 11, 1982, Ridgway was arrested for soliciting prostitution from an undercover female vice cop. But he easily slid out of this trouble, and by July, the series of murders that would shock the nation had begun. Next, on Mugshots, we rejoin the hunt for the killer as desperate investigators in a real-life silence of the lambs turn to infamous serial killer Ted Bundy to seek his help in catching the Green River Killer. Ever since the bodies of the first five women had been found in the Green River, hundreds of tips poured in to Dave Reichert, who was heading up the investigation. A highly complicated case, hundreds, thousands of, of tips. As the case progressed, people would call in, and uh, I think we have, we're over 40,000 uh, suspect tip sheets and thousands of items of evidence. So all the information that's coming in, how do you manage it? The task force began entering all the information and evidence on a first-generation desktop computer. But as they raced to catch up, even more women were being reported missing. This killer had been lucky, too. He had inundated them with victims, suspects, paperwork, and they were drowning. And every weekend, they would find a body, and they had to go out there to the woods. And instead of investigating, they were excavating. When all of a sudden, in just a few short weeks, we have five or six bodies. And, and in that group, you have a first, the first challenge is identify the victim. You can't investigate the case at all until you know who she is. It's just a matter of uh, finding the right person who uh, I'm sure is out there that has the key to this whole case, and uh, eventually I hope we can find him. In the midst of all this activity, 
Gary Ridgway was approached by Port of Seattle police as he sat in his parked truck at one in the morning of August 29th, 1982. He was on a deserted dead-end block near the airport, a block where three Green River killer bodies were later found. Unknown yet to police, another Green River victim had disappeared earlier that day. Ridgway was told to move on. He appears to be um, the average kid that you grow up with. Again, society saying that. And he was no threat to anybody. That's how it, what he appears to be. As police were tailing Melvin Foster, on November 9th, Gary Ridgway tried to strangle a prostitute named Rebecca Gway. Gway said Ridgway had picked her up on the strip and taken her to a wooded area for sex. He suddenly accused her of biting him and started choking her. Somehow she broke free and ran to a nearby mobile home. At the time, she was too terrified to tell police. It's not like the suspect has to get out and grab a hold of these girls, have a struggle with them, handcuff them, tape them, bind them, gag them, and throw them in the car, and they're screaming and yelling for help. They drive up, reach over, open the door, make a deal, hop in the car, and drive off. Meanwhile, in February 1983, Port of Seattle police again rolled up on a parked pickup truck. Inside, they found Gary Ridgway with prostitute Kelly McGinnis. They let him go with a warning. But four months later, McGinnis was added to the list of Green River killings. And then, the task force's single computer crashed in a power surge, wiping out all the months of information that had been entered. By November, six more bodies were found. The pressure was building, and the new sheriff, Vern Thomas, was willing to risk more ambitious plans. He uh, agreed that we should have a, a bigger effort, was able to convince the politicians to put more money. Uh, so in the next few years, $2 million a year was spent each year on this case. By January 1984, Sheriff Thomas announced the formation of a 45-member Green River Task Force. They installed a room-sized computer to correlate all their data. And it took them almost a year and a half to enter all the hard copy information into this computer. The following month, another prostitute told the task force she thought Gary Ridgway was the killer based on his suspicious behavior. Then, in March, 17-year-old topless dancer Cindy Smith disappeared from the strip. Police would later determine that Smith was the last of the Green River killer's victims, that the killings had ended. Investigators now believe that dozens of missing women had been murdered in only 18 months. Their bodies, often hidden in remote locations, would continue to turn up over the next six years. We looked up uh, potential victims, we read missing persons reports to determine if he was still killing, uh, to determine whether police were just being coy and not saying that he was still killing. Over the first three days of April 1984, four more bodies were found in the woods near Star Lake. There was an enormous media mob scene out there. They had a, a TV station from, uh, from Germany, for Pete's sake. Uh, a huge crowd of media people. And so, of course, it, the, the, the Green River murders became disseminated rather widely across the world as, as, a, as a terrible crime. Gary Ridgway was called in and questioned by a task force detective in mid-April. Ridgway admitted dating one of the victims and recognized a photo of another. He also admitted being familiar with some of the sites where bodies were found. Weeks later, Ridgway took and passed a polygraph test, so he was considered cleared as a suspect. Later, they realized that the polygraph probably wasn't a valid polygraph because they hadn't asked him about any of these contacts he had had with some of the other victims. Ridgway's new girlfriend said that he had sex with her twice a day and that he could easily have had sex six or seven times a day. She said his only hobby was going to swap meets and flea markets. She left him in June 1984 after meeting another man. Five months later, Rebecca Gway, the prostitute who claimed Ridgway had choked her, finally contacted the task force and told them her story. They added it to his file for follow-up. They were using some of the same guidelines. A person who's been out there on the street, knows some of the girls, maybe uh, has been outdoors in the woods and uh, is savvy, and Mr. Ridgway fit that bill. 
The investigation was well into its third year, and though the beefed-up task force had been gathering enormous amounts of evidence, they were no closer to capturing the Green River Killer. It was at this time that Detective Reichert received a letter from serial killer Ted Bundy, who was on death row in Florida. Bundy had confessed to killing 28 women in Seattle and other parts of the country. He was watching the case and sent me a letter and he said, uh, hey, uh, I think I can uh, uh, help you uh, get into the mind of, he called our person the river man. And uh, I said, okay. Reichert headed to Stark Prison in Florida to meet the beast in his cage. Basically, he talked in the third person about what the river man would do. And I think, of course, later, and others who interviewed Bundy right before he was put to death learned that some of the things that he was telling us years before in, in the interview I'm talking about, uh, uh, he actually did himself. And we knew that when we were talking to him. Like Hannibal Lecter, Bundy was trying to manipulate the investigators, playing for time to stay his execution. It's very difficult for me, or any, any average person, to put themselves in the mind of a serial killer. We just can't think that way. And uh, so to hear Bundy describe these actions in a third person, I think was beneficial, and it was one of those interviews that any investigator would you know, cut their right arm off for. I mean, it was, it was very interesting. The new insights went into the files. Officially, at least, the murders had stopped, but police continued to find more bodies. Next, on Mugshots, investigators close in on Gary Ridgway, searching his house and collecting vital evidence. By December 1984, the suspected death toll of the Green River killings had risen to 42, with 28 identified bodies and 14 other women missing. It seemed like we were always behind the killer by quite a long ways. In some cases, the, the, uh, the victim was not found until six years after she was uh, determined to be missing. In February 1985, Gary Ridgway was again called in for questioning by the task force about the choking incident reported by prostitute Rebecca Gway. Remarkably, Ridgway confirmed her story. He admitted choking her for 10 to 15 seconds after he claimed she bit him. She ran away, he said, and he drove home. After this interview, Ridgway was put back on the suspect list, and two investigators were assigned to look for any other Ridgway connections to the murders. But he remained only one of many suspects. When task force members went out in the streets to try to find out who might have been the killer, uh, there are too many men with sexual problems. You could find uh, pastors with women's underwear on. Uh, you would find uh, uh, sexual counselors with kitty porn. Essentially, almost every other person, every other man that they stopped on the strip was a potential suspect. That made it very, very difficult for them to find the needle in the haystack. By this time, the evidence from the Green River case that investigators had amassed filled a good portion of the sheriff's evidence warehouse. Everything on this side of the warehouse, on the top section of the racking system, is all Green River related evidence that had been collected from dating back to 1982 there is approximately 10,000 pieces of evidence. Despite the expansion of the task force, the underfunded state crime lab was backed up. At the rate they were going, one investigator estimated, it would take the state crime lab 50 years to analyze just the evidence they had already accumulated. We got down to collecting bird's nests and examining the bird's nests for fibers and hair, because you know that birds fly around, they collect and pick Animal feces is another thing that we collected around the area. The chance that, as, and this is a gruesome thought, but as they nibbled away at the, the victim, uh, maybe they swallowed a, a ring and it's in the feces. We go through that and we look for that. In March 1986, Gary Ridgway was again interviewed by the task force. He said that he was fixated on prostitutes, that they affect him as strongly as alcohol affects an alcoholic. He agreed to take a second polygraph, but three days later, on the advice of an attorney, he refused. There was a guy who kept popping up, and as they looked at this guy, they found a variety of circumstances that seemed to suggest that he might, in fact, be connected to five of the, of the victims. 
Six months later, Ridgway's second wife took task force members to various locations she used to visit with Ridgway during their marriage. Many of them were outdoor locations where she and Ridgway had had sex. Unknown to her, many of them were also spots where bodies had turned up. They found these possible connections between this man, Mr. Ridgway, and these five dry land or missing victims. Finally, on April 8, 1987, police searched Ridgway's home and vehicles. They didn't uh, obtain the physical evidence that uh, would satisfy prosecutors or police, so they didn't charge him. I believe at that time they had a lot of circumstantial evidence. Police felt that he was one of their best suspects or maybe the individual responsible for the serial case, but they had no evidence. We had the foresight to have him chew on a piece of gauze. I mean, that almost seems like it's, you know, it's archaic kind of discussion now with the technology we have today. In March 1988, the task force sent body fluid samples from Opal Mills and Carol Christensen to a laboratory in New York for DNA testing. They wanted to compare them with samples collected from some of their main suspects, including Ridgeway. But the lab responded that the sample was too small to test. Investigators were stymied. They turned their attention to other suspects. It was during this period that Ridgeway met and married his third and current wife. Next, on Mugshots, the task force is once again reduced to one detective who must keep it alive until scientific breakthroughs can further lengthen the long arm of the law. After the 1987 search of Gary Ridgway's home failed to turn up enough evidence to arrest him for the Green River killings, the investigation languished. About that point in time, the political funding and the political support for the investigation begins to fall off and wane, and they start cutting back on the number of people who are assigned to this task force. With dwindling results, the Green River Task Force was disbanded in 1990. But the one detective left on the case, Tom Jensen, carefully preserved their evidence. In 1994, the O.J. Simpson trial televised the complexities of making a DNA case stick, so Jensen remained cautious, waiting for the science to develop. There were only two labs in the United States that conducted this test. They were both on the East Coast, very, very expensive, and it was destructive. It, that meant that when we presented our evidence to them to be examined, that you had to expect that part of the evidence would be destroyed. And so you could only afford to do that a very few amount of times. This is a freezer where we store and maintain all of our evidence that has DNA related to it. Uh, we do have Green River related evidence in this freezer. Um, several boxes of it. Uh, the evidence was actually collected back in the mid-80s. In 1999, the Washington State Police opened a new and more sophisticated crime lab in Seattle. By the following year, the lab began conducting DNA tests with a revolutionary new method. They could now use much smaller evidence samples to culture DNA amounts large enough to measure. By 2001, Detective Tom Jensen was ready to risk his small, precious samples from the crime scenes. The tests worked, and in October, they produced three matches to a single suspect. We do have DNA evidence on uh, four cases. We have DNA that is consistent, and some situations actually match totally. The news among investigators was electrifying. So Tom then takes the third piece of paper and he flips it over and the title over the top is, you know, for us internally was the Green River Killer. And he says, this is, you know, the, the profile here and it, you can see it's similar to the other three. And uh, so I get a little grin on my face, you know. Tom's got a smile on his face and he says, and here's the guy. He hands me the envelope. And I said, uh, don't tell me, I know who it is. It's Gary Ridgway. He opens the envelope, pulls out the mug shot of, I think, 1982 arrest, and it was Ridgway. Armed with the DNA match, police immediately placed Ridgway under surveillance. 
on November 16th, he was arrested trying to solicit an undercover female vice cop for prostitution. In his pickup truck, police found $30 and a pair of latex gloves. He paid a fine and was released. Finally, on November 30th, 2001, police moved into the Kenworth Trucking Company and arrested Gary Leon Ridgway for murder. Gotten word from my older son, he'd called over here and said, turn your TV on real quick, it's gonna, it's breaking all over the place, they're gonna announce an arrest in the Green River case. I put it on and they said, Gary, and Dave Records said, Gary Ridgway, and this has been a long time coming. I'm thinking, that's a stupid truck painter. Gary Ridgway had been arrested of um, the murders for the girls. But I was thinking, uh, I have to go through all this again. And then my next thought was, well, at least he's been caught now. No more can happen. We couldn't believe it. You know, total shock, man. So I don't, saw his picture on TV and I told her, I said, hey, I know that guy. And that's when they first flashed it and she said, oh, you know everybody. And then they flashed it again. I said, holy smoke, that's, that's Gary back behind the fence. Boy, it's, I tell you, it was a great day. Ridgway was denied bail. Is your true name Gary Leon Ridgway? Yes, it is. He was charged with the murders of Opal Mills, Cynthia Hines, Marsha Chapman, and Carol Christensen. What I'm pleased about is that it's We've got four, four uh, cases uh, charged, and uh, that the, the science is there, and the possibility is there now to solve the rest of them. Ridgeway's veteran defense lawyer, Anthony Savage, questions the evidence revealed so far and maintains his client's innocence. Gary Ridgeway is a 53-year-old, 30-year truck painter from Kenmore, honorably discharged from the uh, Armed forces, blue collar worker, no pretensions, just a regular knockabout guy. That's who he is. He was just one of an awful lot of uh, fellas out there um, doing whatever you did on the strip. I'm not foolish enough to sit here and tell you that the state doesn't have some evidence. I accept that, that they have some stuff. but. That doesn't mean that the stuff is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Savage dismisses the DNA evidence. Let's assume for the sake of assumption that Mr. Ridgway's DNA was found in a prostitute. All it shows is that there was a rather close contact between Mr. Ridgway and the lady involved. Well, that's the object of prostitution, isn't it? So, uh, I don't make anything out of that. That certainly doesn't make the customer a murderer. The problem that Mr. Ridgway faces is how does he explain how this, his DNA came to be associated with three of these four victims? And as I understand it, he said, well, yes, he admits that he had sex with them, but the problem with that is, is that how is it possible that every time Mr. Ridgway has sex with somebody, someone else comes along and kills him? I mean, what is the likelihood of that? It's just not very good. Investigators have no evidence that Carol Christensen, the married mother of a three-year-old daughter, was ever involved in prostitution. And yet with her, Ridgway's DNA matched completely. Hours before his arrest for murder, Ridgway told detectives that he never had sex with her. We're describing him as a person who has been uh, arrested for and charged with four of the victims who have been on the original list entitled Green River Killings, and that he is also being investigated for the remainder of those. Coming up on Mugshots, the Green River Killer, 20 years later. Today, Gary Ridgway sits in a small, solitary confinement cell in the King County Jail, awaiting trial for four of the Green River killings. It could take at least two years to prepare for trial. If you were to sit down with Mr. Ridgway, which you are not going to do, um, 
but in an ordinary setting without knowing who he was, after half an hour's conversation, if I was to say to you, that's the Green River Monster, you would say, no way. Just no way that that, could, that that man could have done these things. Every now and then a question will be asked. This question will be asked, and it is, well, if you've got him for four, you've charged four cases, why do you have to spend you know, a couple million dollars a year now to investigate the rest of them? And my answer is, what would you say to me if that was your daughter over here? I know what I would say. I want you to follow that case up. I want you to find the guy that killed my daughter, period. And that's what we're going to do. The Green River Task Force has been revived, and many detectives continue to gather evidence on the four murder charges and work to see if they can tie Ridgeway to any of the other Green River killings. I was the lead investigator in Green River, and when that was mentioned, there was always a little whisper, a little smirk, you know, well, yeah, big deal. It was, you know, he never solved it. <laughs> so now I can say with uh, a lot of pride, I was the lead uh, investigator for eight years, and uh, we've charged somebody with four murders. The night of Ridgway's arrest, one detective's call about the DNA results left Melvin Foster feeling vindicated. He called down here and said, you weren't even close. <laughs> and, well, that kind of answers some questions for Doubting Thomas, doesn't it? Melvin Foster, he still is a person of interest in other cases. The prolonged frustration of a case unsolved for 20 years has taken its toll on many of those associated with it. I live down south and uh, every time I go home or come to Seattle, I pass by um, a lot of these body sites. So uh, my life essentially has been defined by where women were found in Green River and uh, sometimes I'm told that I can't remember a phone number to my brother-in-law, but I remember the de uh, date of birth and all the statistics relating to the young ladies, and, and that's correct. Uh, I uh, covered the case for so long, for so many years, that uh, I still remember every detail about them. When I began working on it, it became it was an interesting newspaper story for me. And then it became an intellectual puzzle. Later it became more of an obsession. And it, be, it began to affect me, certainly. By the time that I was at the end of my time with the Seattle Times, I had become pretty, most of my friends will tell you, pretty crazy on the entire subject. I can drive east into the mountains here and it's beautiful, it's a winter wonderland. Most people can drive through there and just comment about the beauty, but I know where bodies were found. And then I've made friends with the victims' families and relatives and, and uh, so a lot of emotion is attached to this. And you know, when, when Tom Jensen came in and shared that, and I shared that little story with you, when he came in and shared that, he, he had tears in his eyes. So did I. So we do care. How could he do such a thing? So many times, how could he do it? Didn't he have any conscience at all? When they arrested Ridgeway and they mentioned that they had DNA, my feeling was that, good, they got him.